Yes, it is. Come on, this is awesome. Yeah. That's right, I thank the Father. All right, Genesis 34 is where we're going to start today. Kind of like an extended call to worship in a, a more mainline church. I'm just going to read it. You can read along and it sinks in your head two different ways. And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and he lay with her and he defiled her. Now I could do a whole sermon on this chapter. There is so much going on here, starting from she's going out to hang out with other people who aren't Israelites. But I, I'm going to refrain from that because there's another reason we're here today. And his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel, and he spake kindly unto the damsel. And Shechem spake unto his father Hamor, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter, now his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field and when they heard it, and the men were grieved, and they were very wroth, because he had wrought folly in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. And Hamor communed with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. I pray you give her to him to wife. And make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you. And ye shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade ye therein, and get your possessions therein. And Shechem said unto her father, and unto her brethren, let me find grace in your eyes, and what ye shall say unto me, I will give. Ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will give according as ye shall say unto me, but give me the damsel to wife. And the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor his father deceitfully, and said, because he had defiled Dinah their sister. And they said unto them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that were a reproach unto us. But in this we will consent unto you, if you be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised. Then we will give you our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters unto us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. Remember, these are not Israelites. And if you will not hearken unto us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter, and we will be gone. And their words pleased Hamar and Shechem Hamar's son. And the young man deferred not to do the thing, because he had delight in Jacob's daughter, and he was more honorable than the house of his father. And Hamor and Shechem his son came unto the gate of their city, and they communed with the men of their city, saying, These men are peaceable with us, therefore let, it, let them dwell in the land, and trade therein for the land. Behold, it is a large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us for wives, and let us give them our daughters." Only herein will the men consent unto us to dwell with us, to be one people, if every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised. Shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours? <laughs> I added that. <laughs> Only let us consent unto them, and they will dwell with us. And unto Hamor and unto Shechem his son hearkened all that went out of the gate of the city. And every male was circumcised, all that went out of the gate of the city. And it came to pass on the third day, when they were sore, that the two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword, and they came upon the city boldly, and they slew all the males. And they slew Hamar and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword, and they took Dinah out of Shechem's house, and they went out. And the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled city, because they had defiled their sister. They took their sheep and their oxen and their asses and that which was in the city and that which was in the field, and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took they captive, and they spoiled even all that was in the house. 
And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, Ye have troubled me to make me to stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And I, being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. And they said, Should he deal with our sister as with a harlot? That's a fascinating story, but we're not going there today. It, we read it for a purpose, which will become clear as we go to Joshua chapter 5. Just understand that this has already happened by the time we get to Joshua chapter 5. <laughs> All right. Joshua chapter 5, verse 1. And it came to pass... When all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of the Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, that's further westward, heard that Yahweh had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until they were passed over, that their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. So remember that the Israelites crossed over the Jordan. It was a miracle because the, of the ark was there and the waters piled up. And so just on the other side of the Jordan River lived the Amorites. Now the Amorites are the ones who originally established Babylon as a small little city. But they put it on the map. They went out there and moved the rocks around or something. But they started Babylon. They were a mountainous people, mountain people. Like us. Uh, they were a mountain people that kind of originated out of what is today Syria, by all best uh, historical records and things. They were regarded by their peers in the early days of their beginnings as outright savages. They were nomadic. They didn't raise crops. They didn't cook their meat. They didn't even have houses. And so the, the more advanced cultures looked at them as tuh. Now they've advanced beyond that now to, to where we're reading about them now, but that's, that kind of stigma stuck with them. They're descended, the Amorites come from Canaanites, from Canaan, um, and Canaan, the man, came from Ham, who was Noah's son. So they're Hamites as opposed to Shemites, despite what you read in uh, some other writings. In Amos chapter 2, verse 9, we can read that they were giants. Og was their king. Og of Bashan was an Amorite. Moses has already fought him and defeated him uh, on the other side of the Jordan, because they weren't just on this side of Jordan. They were everywhere. Uh, but now they're on that side of the Jordan. So uh, Og was a giant, and he was an Amorite. And Moses and his people had fought them. The Canaanites, on the other hand, because it says the the Amorites are just on, as they're crossing the Jordan River, they're just on the other side of this part of the land. And by the way, that's where we call Israel the nation state of today, is basically on this side of the Jordan and down. And that's kind of what we're talking about today. So the, the Amorites are here, and then further out towards the sea, that's where the Canaanites are. And the Canaanites is a broad term, and it's used broadly for many different people. Sometimes the Amorites in the Bible are called Canaanites, but here... There's a distinction. And so they, they lived along the coastal Mediterranean. And they became later, after this, what we call the Phoenicians, mm -hmm. who were world traders and probably came to America, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just kind of putting it in context, who, who this is. It came to pass, the kings, they, so the kings of the Amorites and the king of the Canaanites hear about them crossing the Jordan and Yahweh holding the waters back. Now, do you remember when the spies were in Jericho and that woman said, oh, we've heard about you guys. We've heard how, how Yahweh is with you and has helped you slain all these people and I'm afraid of him and I fear him and I want to worship him. I'm with you. Well, that was before they crossed the river. Now they've crossed the river and Yahweh's Word is spreading more. His works are spreading. And so it says, let me get the exact wording in King James. Um, when they heard that they had passed over, that their heart melted, neither was their spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. So they were disheartened. They were like, oh, oh no. 
They were lacking what I wrote here in my notes, esprit de corps. From a military context, esprit de corps, esprit de corps is huge. It is, it, men fight, and you'll read this anywhere, if you do any kind of reading at all about combat. When men go to battle, whether it's the Civil War or it's the Romans fighting my people in the, is it Teutonburg? Teutonburg Forest? Teutonburg. Wherever. When men fight, at the end of the day, they're not fighting for the cause. They're not fighting to kill the godless communist or to kick the Russians out of our land. At the end of the day, they're fighting with, for the guy on their left and their right. It's like, I'm not going to anything happen to Brother Tony, and he's right here, and I'm killing bad guys to keep them off of him. Everybody says that. They've done all kinds of studies on it. And where you get that from is the esprit de corps of the unit, which is basically group cohesion. We identify as a group. It's group loyalty. I am loyal to this group, this merry band of men, or, or whatever. Um, it's the morale of the unit. And so the Amorites and the Canaanites, when they hear this, their morale goes through the floor. It's just like they have bad morale. They don't want to fight anymore. They're afraid. Their spirit leaves them. Some of the ways that esprit de corps is enhanced, promoted within the unit. And this is important because you have esprit de corps in your family. You have esprit de corps in your clan, in your tribe, in your church, in your whatever. It, it, it goes to many different levels. So at some level, you are responsible for the esprit de corps of your people. And one way is unique traditions. You have a family tradition, you have a tribal tradition, you have a unit tradition. When we were in Special Forces, we did Menton Day every winter where we got together with the Canadians from the first Special Service Force of World War II, and we had a big ball and a dance and everything, but we did that all the time. And it, we only did it, nobody else did it. So it was something we had that was like our little, our little thing that other people didn't do. So I'm telling you that having a family tradition it's not a bad thing. I'm telling you that having an assembly tradition is not a bad thing. Now, you can take it wrong and go do some godless Baal worshiping stuff tradition, and that's not good. But if your family decides every Friday's pizza night, you know, or something like that, that's fine. You, you can do that, and it helps with the esprit. Another thing is unique uh, dress. Think about the Israelites. The Israelites, y'all told them all to wear tzitzit, right? It's Numbers 15. And he says, wear ZZ so that you will remember and keep my commandments. It's, it's basically what he tells them. But guess what? It also sets them apart from everybody else. So when they see another brethren with ZZ, it's like, ah, we got this thing. We're together. We're on the tribe. We're on the same team. Don't you, when you're out there in the, in the world, in the land, and you see somebody with ZZ, don't you say hi to them? I do. I'm always like, hey, how you doing? I'm Joe Fox. Where are you guys from? And talk to them. And so that's, that's an esprit on, on a larger scale. And then there's customs uh, that, that different groups have. We have our own customs, our own way of doing things. And there's a sense of history. And again, there's the history, and you can go from large to smaller, from small to large. We know we have a history. We're reading it right now as Israelites. We, we have this history. It goes back. We have a history of shofarians, right? From when we came here to this land and dumped it, and some of you have been here from before when we had, or barely had the, uh, the old community center set up and you've seen it fall into the current state of disrepair. Others have just gotten here and just saw it in the state of disrepair. And now we have this. But you know what? 15, 20 years from now, people will be saying, oh man, I remember when we built this thing. Right? And so th that's customs and that's a sense of history that we have together. Same thing with your family. Do you remember when we moved to the Ozarks? Oh yeah, we used to live in, you know, wherever. Um, so these things unite and they're important. So it says one more time, the spirit, uh, um, the spirit in them, they didn't have the spirit in them anymore, and their heart <laughs> melted. What we have instead of these godless heathens, what we have is if Yah be for us, if Elohim be for us, who can stand against us? Who can be against us? We're on the right side. And so I'm telling you, there's times coming in our future, perhaps, when we're going to feel like, oh, man, don't. Don't lose your morale. Don't lose your esprit. Understand that if he's with us, we've won. The battle's already won. All right. That's a lot for one verse. Verse 2. At that time, Yahweh said unto Joshua, 
Make thee, now it says in the King James, sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. Who has another word other than sharp knives? Make a flint. Flint knives. That's actually better. But they're both true. Does anybody here know what obsidian is? Obsidian is black volcanic rock. It looks like glass. It, it is the easiest thing to make arrowheads out of. They actually, some surgeons use obsidian blades, not metal blades, because it's like 10 or 100 times sharper, the edge of obsidian, when you strike it right, than, than you can get a steel scalpel. It gets down to the micro, electric micros, electro microscope, is that what they're called? Electron microscope. Electron microscope level, and it just looks huge difference between the two. Flint is not obsidian, but flint is a rock, and it gets really sharp. And so instead of the bronze that these guys were using, you know, the, the dull swords that they would just bludgeon each other to death with, really, um, and it wasn't like fine Japanese katana steel, um, he said, hey, make flint rocks and circumcise yourselves a second time. It doesn't mean that the men had been circumcised and now somehow they're going to circumcise them again, which is impossible. It's, they got circumcised. Before they left Egypt, they were circumcising, but they hadn't done it the whole time, as we're going to find out. They were in the desert for 40 years. And what happened to that original generation of people that left? They died. So now we've got this whole generation of Israelite males who have not been circumcised. Um, so, Yah tells them to do it. And, make sure we're okay here. Yep. Let me see here. And Joshua made him sharp knives, and he circumcised the children of Israel at, Israel at the hill of foreskins. And this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. All the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, they died in the wilderness, by the way, after they came out of Egypt. We knew that. Now all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness, by the way, as they came forth out of Egypt, them they had not circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people that were men of war, which came out of Egypt, were consumed because, so here we're going to find out why those people died and didn't make it to the promised land, because they obeyed not the voice of Yahweh unto whom, that airplane sounds weird, unto whom Yahweh swore that he would not show them the land which Yahweh swear unto their fathers that he would give us a land that flows with milk and honey. It's like, you've done messed up. You're not going to go see the land of milk and honey. And their children, whom he raised up in their stead, them Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised, by the way. Yahweh gave a command to his people before they were even Israelites to circumcise the males. Um, let's go to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis 17, verse 10, I think is where we're going to start. Verse 9. And Elohim said unto Abraham, You shall keep my covenant, therefore, you and your seed after you in their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your seed after you. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought for money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. My covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So this is before the, the Israelites. This is Abraham, right? The, this is during the Abrahamic covenant. It's been a rule. Now, the first generation, and it, grant me that, the, the generation that left Egypt. So in this case, we're just calling that first. Um, they were disobedient and they perished. We just read that in Joshua. 
But guess what? Just because they perish doesn't mean Yah's plan, Yah's work that he wants to happen, it's not going to get abated. It's going to happen. It's like I said, if the Father, if the Holy Spirit comes on you to go share Yeshua with somebody, some stranger that you see, it's like, man, i got to go talk to them about Jesus. And you don't do it? If Yah wants that person to talk to about Jesus, it's going to happen. Somebody else is going to. It's just not going to be you. And you're the one who's going to lose because of that. His work isn't going to be disturbed. He knows what he wants to get done. And so the second generation comes up and they're getting circumcised. What day? Did he say to do it on? What? Eighth day. Eighth day. <clears throat> I looked this up to make sure it wasn't some messianic rumor stuff. Because I remember hearing it. So I actually looked it up. I went to, to I found medical journals talking about it. When a child in America, probably in Western Europe, is circumcised, a male, they give them a shot of vitamin K at the same time. Because babies, one, two, three-year-old, day-old babies, they don't have in them what they need to make blood coagulate. I actually sent a thing to my daughter, not for that, because I, I, I know she knows where I'm going with this. But what it said is babies between uh, two and five days old are at grave risk. You cannot let them get cut. Because they'll bleed a lot if a baby... Now, who's, how's a baby two to five days old going to get cut, right? They're all wrapped up and, and everybody's holding them. But it's important because they don't have blood uh, clotting agents in them. Blood clotting agents platelets and whatever, are formed because of vitamin K, and vitamin K is formed in the intestines. And so that baby has to start eating and producing little baby poops, um, and then things start growing on in their intestines, and they produce vitamin K, and they are at the highest rate of vitamin K, which is, helps them to coagulate blood at day eight of life. It's actually over 100% of human need is at day eight, and then it drops off after that. So it peaks at day eight when you circumcise a child. If that's not proof that the father knows what he's talking about, because nobody knew about that when this was written. They didn't know about vitamin K and coagulating and stuff. It's just do it on day eight. And so the father has a plan. And I just thought that was really cool about the vitamin K thing. Um, now, verse eight. And it came to pass, when they had done the circumcising of the people, that they abode in their places in the camp till they were whole. Because I've got to tell you, um, they didn't have anesthesia back in the day. And if you're an adult male, um, that's probably not a comfortable experience for the next couple days until you heal up. So they're like, oh, we're just going to hang out here in my tent for a couple days until I feel like walking. Think about this. Remember when the spies were in, the, in Rahab's house and she said, quick, run away, go to the mountains because they're going to look for you at the river, right? Because they know they're coming. And so they run to the mountains and then they go to the river. Now they cross the river. They have crossed into enemy territory. Also, as we're going to find out eventually, they're really close to Jericho where they cross the river. So here's the river. Let me show, I get it from your perspective. They crossed the river here. Jericho's here. It would have been smarter from a military perspective to cross the river down here or up here if Jericho's right here. Because do you think Jericho's sending out patrols to see if they're going to come across the river? You know they are. So it doesn't make sense to cross at the nearest point to Jericho, but they did. So now they're in enemy territory. The enemy knows they're coming. Jericho is probably the strongest city in this whole new land. So it's, it's a formidable problem. And now, in the face of the enemy, we've just crossed into their land, which is going to make them want to come fight us, presumably. Let's circumcise all our males. So we lay up helpless in our tents. The reason we went to Genesis 34 is the two brothers went out there and told all the guys they lied to them. They said, all right, you get circumcised, we'll let you marry our women. And then when the guys are all laying, they're going, Ugh! they came in and killed them all because they couldn't fight. So think about that. These people are doing something that is nuts from a military perspective. It's crazy. Why are they doing it? 
Because Yah told them to do it. That's exactly right. Yahweh said, do this thing. And so this is a faith thing. Joshua's a leader. He knows military concepts. He knows military tactics. He knows from a military perspective, circumcising all my guys with Jericho right over there, and I just cross into their land, uh, is not a great idea. But he's obedient, and he follows what the Father tells him to do, and obedience brings blessing. So he has faith, and he has obedience. Nine. And Yahweh said unto Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off of you, whereof the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. That reproach of Egypt that he's talking about is, hey, you guys were all slaves. You were at the bottom of the totem pole. People were enacting their will upon you as a people. Hey, those days are gone. New day has arrived. You have come to the promised land. You're getting right with the Father, in his case with me, y'all saying that. And you are no longer, that, that stigma of you being slaves, it, that's gone. Watch what I'm going to do with you here in the new land, in, in the promised land. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal, and they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month that evening in the plains of Jericho. Because remember last week, I think, we talked about how it was really close to Passover when they came across now, there's a good argument to be made that not only did they not circumcise in the 40 years they were in the wilderness, they didn't keep Passover either the whole time, these disobedient people. Now, let's go to Exodus 12 real quick. Exodus 12, because why are they all laying around the camp? Circumcised. Right, and what are they observing now? Passover. Passover. That's where we're going. Exodus 12. I'm in Genesis, that won't work. There we go, 14. Exodus, oh, I want to be in Genesis. I'm sorry, Genesis 12, 48. Mm. La, la, la. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. All right. I'm good. I had a marker. You guys are all going to beat me there. All right, there we go. No. I think it's Exodus 12, 48, I think. What? I think it is Exodus. I think it is Exodus. I wrote Genesis and I knew I was wrong. Yeah. It is. It's Exodus 12, 48. All right. It's talking about Passover. Matter of fact, I'll just start in 43 while you guys are turning in Exodus 12. And Yahweh said unto Moshe and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall be no stranger. Eat it. But every man's servant that is bought for money, your slaves, when thou hast circumcised him, then he shall eat thereof. A foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. You don't invite guests to Passover. If they're not an Israelite, they don't get to come to Passover. It's not like Sukkot. So think about that. That's a learning point right there. In one house shall have eaten, thou shalt not carry forth aught the flesh abroad out of the house, neither shall ye break the bone thereof. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover of Yahweh, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near to keep it, and he shall be as one is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. You can't eat the Passover meal if you're not circumcised. That actually became an issue here at Shofar Mountain. A brother came up to me and said, hey, here's this thing. What do you say? I said, wow, I hadn't read that before. <laughs> hadn't read it in that context before. It's like, yeah, I guess you better go get circumcised. Don't worry, it's modern medicine. It won't hurt nearly as much. Uh, you can imagine how that ended up happening. Um, but there you go. So... Here they are, no uncircumcised male shall keep Passover. Well, here Joshua, the father is making sure Joshua understands, circumcise all your males because we got Passover coming up and we're going to start keeping these feasts. We're going to start obeying the father. We're going to start doing the things he tells us to do. Verse 11 in Joshua chapter 5. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes, because then it's unleavened bread, and parched corn in the selfsame day. Verse 12, and the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna anymore, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan. 
that year. So we don't really think about that either. They were still eating manna after they crossed the, the river, Jordan. It's kind of like this manna cloud followed them around. But it stops. It stops at this point. No more freebies, guys. And it wasn't totally free. They had to go pick it up. It's not like somebody spoon-fed it to them. But it's pretty free. It's like laying out, excuse me, laying out there. Um, I think one reason of it is uh, don't get lazy, right? You, you've gotten really used to me giving you everything, giving you this food. The Father still provides Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh Yireh. Right? But that doesn't mean you don't have to work for it. By the sweat of your brow shall you eat your bread. And so they have to earn their food now uh, more directly, just like they have to earn their place in the promised land. They're, they're getting ready to fight again in the promised land. And yeah, it's yours, uh, but you've got to fight for it. Yes, there, there's food in the land, but you're going to have to go get it. There's kind of a break here. Mm -hmm. And we're going into a new part which I think is fascinating. But I must have a sip of my coffee before I continue, because I'm getting a little parched. This next part is really neat. And if you have a King James Bible, there's even a break in it. There's like a double, double space right there. Verse 13 of Joshua uh, chapter 5. And it came to pass... When Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and he looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. So clearly this is around the Passover time. Could be a day or two later because it talks about, you know, how they ate after that. But it's around that time. And it says Joshua is over against Jericho. So Joshua is really close to Jericho. He's like right outside the walls of Jericho. Why do you think he's there? Sister Kate's got it, but she's been married to me for 35 years. He's doing what's called a leader's recon, a leader's reconnaissance, because that's their next fight. And so he is going there to get a feel for the ground around Jericho, to get a look-see at what these walls look like, how is what is the atmosphere? Are there people coming to and fro in these hills? Or are they all hiding in their village? He's getting the smells of the battlefield. It's a real thing to do a leader's recon. You can look on Google Images. You can have your spies from the land come back and tell you everything that they saw. But until the leader goes and actually looks at the battlefield himself, he doesn't have a full appreciation. And we still do this today. Before the battle, the leader goes and looks at the land. And says, all right, this is how we're going to do it. And so that's what he's doing. He's going to do a leader's reconnaissance of Jericho so that he can finalize his plans for the attack on Jericho. That's important to what's happening. So he sees this guy over against him. That means he's close by. And this dude's got a sword in his hand. Now, you carry a sword in what normally? A sheath. Why do you pull your sword out? Because you're going to fight, or you're scared. It's just like pulling your handgun out, right? It's like, I may have to actually use this thing. So your gun's in your hand. So he sees this man with a sword in his hand. Let's look at the next verse. Oh, no, let's look at the rest of this verse. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Are you with us, for us, or for our adversaries? Joshua sees this guy over there, as we're going to find out, coming up, an impressive man, and he goes over to him and says, hey, are you with us or are you with our enemy? That's very aggressive, don't you think? He could have said, oh, dude, I saw a guy with a sword out. He was ready for battle. I scooted back here. We got to think about this. No, he confronted this man. He goes up to him. He's, so he's aggressive. He's also protective, right? He wants to find out, is this guy with us? Or is he with our enemies? Because he's protective of all of Israel, is what Joshua is doing. These are awesome leadership traits. He's an aggressive leader. He's not standing by. He's actually out there on his, he's probably not on his own, but he's out there himself looking at the land of the battle. He's not just sending somebody out there to do it. When he sees a potential danger, he's not afraid to confront it. 
He's not afraid to go up to it and get a, an answer. What do you, if the guy had said, if the man had said, I'm with your adversaries, what do you think Joshua would have done? <laughs> and there'd be a fight, right? No, and he's protective of his people. These are good traits, so let's keep going. <clears throat> and he said, this is the, the man, what the man says. Now he said, let's look at the question. Joshua went to him and he said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And then he, the man, said, Nay, no, but as captain of the host of Yahweh am I now come. Mm. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my master unto his servant? That's a different word if you're reading King James. What's... So he's calling this, this man master, and he says, what do you have to say to me? Now think about that. He says, are you with us, or are you with our enemy? And the answer to that question is, no. Right? It's like, what I like to do to people is they say, Joe, are you hungry, or have you already had enough to eat? I like saying yes. Because you should never ask a question like that, right? But he's like, are you with us, or for our enemies? And so the answer is, Either the correct answer to that question is I'm with you or I'm with, I'm with the other guys. You're the enemy, buddy. But the answer he's given is no. Here's why. Joshua asked the wrong question. It's like, no. Wrong. Next question. Let me help you. Whose side are you on, Joshua? That's really the implied question because look what the man says. He says, no, but as a captain of the host of the army of Yahweh, am I now come? I'm with the Lord's army. I'm the captain of the Lord's army. Some, some versions say prince. I'm in charge of Yahweh's army. You may command the Israelite army. You're in charge of the Israelite army. I'm in charge of God's army. Whose side are you on? Right? That's really what this is, is coming right back at him as. Who is this guy? Michael. Who's this man? Notice this. It says, And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and he did worship. And he said unto him, What do you have to say to me? There are many occasions, there are several occasions in the Bible where people are confronted with an angel and the first thing they do when they see that angel is fall on their face and worship the angel because evidently angels are awesome looking in person. It's like, whoa! And in every single instance, what does the angel say? Stand up. Get up. Do not worship me. I'm a messenger for the Most High. Yeah. Words to that effect. This angel does not say that. Let's continue. He says, what says my Lord unto a servant? Verse 15, and the captain of Yahweh's army said unto Joshua, get up, get up, don't worship me. Uh -uh. He said, loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. He said, get your shoes off your feet. He didn't say don't worship me. He didn't say get up. He said, while you're down there, you better kick those sandals off. Because this is holy ground. This guy's Yeshua. Mm -hmm. This man is Yeshua. He's commanding Yah's army. Um, let's go real quick. Shoes off. Let's go to Exodus 3. Exodus chapter 3. Sister Kate likes this. I've heard her mention it in context with other religions before. Exodus chapter 3, verse 4. So, the father, it, Yahweh, is in the bush, the burning bush. Moses sees it. In verse 3, Moses says, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, the bush that is not burnt, right? The burning bush. Verse 4, and Yahweh saw that he was turned aside to see. And Elohim called to him out from the midst of the bush, and he said, Moshe, Moshe. And he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither. <laughs> I love that English. Don't come any closer. Stop. Put 
thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place wherein thou stands is holy ground. You do not stand in the presence of the Father with your shoes on. You're not bringing that filth into his presence that you've trekked around in. This is Yeshua that he is in the presence of. We're back in Joshua now. This is Yeshua that he's in the presence of. And he says, I'm the commander of Yah's army. Yeah, he is. He's going to be in command of Yah's army again. We just read about that in Revelation when he comes back that final time. It's Yeshua that he's talking to. So why this meeting? Joshua's out doing his leader's recon. He's checking out Jericho. He knows he's going to fight for it. The father told him, this is your land. And then, bang. And I know I just went over that really quick. There's a lot of people who think the first time Yeshua was on earth to speak of was when he was born to Mary and Joseph. That is not the case. You can look at uh, who did Jacob wrestle with. Whenever, can a man... Can a human look upon the face of Yah? No. He cannot. So whenever God is in the presence of man uh, that we've read about so far, that's Yeshua on the earth. Jacob wrestled with Yeshua. He didn't wrestle with Yahweh. Right? He, he couldn't do that. Uh, I submit Melchizedek was Yeshua. It's just having to talk with somebody about that. There's other instances where Yeshua came before. This is one of those cases. This is Yeshua. And if you have a King James Version, it's all capitalized anyway. Um, so you kind of get a clue when you're looking at that. But why the meeting? While he's up there doing this leader's recon, Yeshua shows up to him and says, you know, whose side are you on, Joshua, basically? Number one, we talked about esprit de corps. It's important for leaders, too. And at the end of the day, Joshua is a great leader, but he's still a man. And he is facing incredible odds, and he's in a bad position because all those guys are back there laying up sorry, circumcised. And here are these huge walls of Jericho that he's looking at. And he's probably starting somewhere deep inside, even this man of faith Joshua, to go, ooh, I don't know how we're going to do this. So one reason that, that Yeshua is there is to build up Joshua's confidence. And it's to give him, I submit, what we call in the military commander's intent. Give Joshua the plan for the battle. This is how this battle is going to go, Joshua. I'm the commander of the Lord's army. You're the commander of the Israelites. We like you, but, you know, you're still 18 B team down here. Let me show you how this is going to go. And so I think that's why he's meeting with them right there for the battle that's going to come. Yeshua is there to plus him up and to give him uh, the details of the plan. We... And you, on YouTube, um, we have a battle coming. In fact, I believe the battle is already in its first stages right now. But there is definitely a battle coming. And so you have to ask yourself personally, looking in the mirror, how is your esprit de corps? How is your morale for what's coming? Are you being obedient to the Father? Because see, obedient, obedience brings the blessings. Obedience brings the success, even in the, in the face of huge odds. Are you listening to your commander? The commander. The commander of the armies. Do you understand the plan, and are you prepared for what's coming? Because this is all what Joshua was facing right there. And I'm telling you, the answers to all those questions are right here and right there with him, with Yeshua, with Yah, with the Father. And we all have to have open communication with him. We have to have open communication lines for what's coming. Let's pray.